Hello. Good evening. Thank you all very much for coming in tonight. Um, before we get started, um, can I politely ask you all to turn your mobile phones on silent mode? Um, so we are very pleased to have um, our four guests here tonight. Uh, but before I introduce them, uh, I'll say something very brief about the POA. Then I'll introduce the individuals that are here tonight. And then I'll say something about the structure of this event. So the POA is the Public Occasion Agency, um, which was established a little more than a year ago by Scrap Marshall, who's now in control of the camera, and by myself. We are both students in uh, the Diploma School. And as part of our institutional enterprise, um, you might have come across these. Um, this is a preview document, which we print to announce the event. Um, as a kind of counterpart to this, we commission uh, an individual for each event to conduct a review, which we publish in the same format. These collide in the Public Occasion Agency archive, a book that we hope to publish this summer. Um, so tonight is our 20th and actually our last planned event. Um, and I'll now very proudly introduce the four guests that we have here tonight. Um, first of all, we have Armin Linke. Um, Armin was born in 1966 and lives in Milan and in Berlin. He is an artist working with photography, combining different mediums to blur the boundary between fiction and reality. He is working on an ongoing archive on human activity and the most varied natural and man-made landscapes. His multimedia installation about contemporary alpine landscape was awarded at the 9th Architecture Venice Biennale and at Gross Architecture Film Festival. He is a guest professor at the uh, HFG Karlsruhe and at the IUAV Arts and Design University in Venice and is a research affiliate at the MIT Visual Arts Program Cambridge. Then we have, um, very familiar to you all of course, um, Samantha Hardingham who probably doesn't need an introduction as this is her home base but I'll do it anyway. Um, Sam is an architectural author and researcher. She studied at the Architectural Association, then went on to, the cr to open the critically acclaimed Crowbar Coffee, which was a number of small regenerative venues in London. This was, this was between 1993 and 2000. She has completed a number of books, including those on the work of Cedric Price. She was a vis visiting scholar at the Canadian Centre of Architecture in Montreal, uh, where she uh, undertook further research on the work of Cedric Price uh, that will hopefully eventually definitely lead to the commission to complete works publication of Cedric Price. Uh, and she's also a first year uh, studio tutor uh, here at the AA since 2006. Then we have Hans Ulrich Obrist. Hans is the co-director of the Serpentine Gallery here in London. He has served as the curator of the Musée d'Art Moderne uh, de la Ville de Paris um, and the Museum in Progress in Vienna. Um, Hans has curated over 250 exhibitions worldwide and is a contributing editor of Arbitare, Art Forum, Paradis Magazine and O32C Magazine. And on the, on the other side of the table we have Marcus Meesen. Marcus is an architect and a writer. In 2002 he set up Studio Meesen, which is a col collaborative agency for spatial practice and cultural inquiry. In 2007 he co-founded the architectural practice NOFIS. He is the founder and director of the Winter School Middle East. Marcus is the author and editor of the Participation Trilogy, as well as many other books and international publications. He is taught here at the AA, at the Berlage Institute, and he currently holds a professorship for architecture and curatorial practice at the Hochschule für Gestaltung in Karlsruhe. Okay, so these are our guests. Then I'll say something brief about this event. Um, which I think is important to, clari to clarify how the event came about. So the event finds its origin at the uh, Venice Architecture Biennale last summer where both Scrap and me were present to uh, help organize the Beyond Entropy Symposium of the AA. Uh, in the main exhibition of the, um, of the Biennale, we found this, uh, this absolutely amazing exhibition on Cedric Price but we felt this exhibition was slightly underexposed as it was situated in a, in a, in a, in a bit of a leftover space in the, in the, in the building. Kind of <laughs> um, so we found out that this, this exhibition was curated by Sam and by Hans. Um, 
and it contained, it contained uh, amongst other components, an installation made by students of Armin and Marcus. Um, this project, which is now also uh, on display in the front members' room in the Wish We Were Here exhibition, became our first step towards this event. So with the background knowledge that Marcus has his ongoing fascination with archives, um, we initially, initially contacted him to discuss the possibility of doing an event around the topic of the archive, and in particular this project. The confirmation of this event, uh, together with our personal uh, fascination with the work of Cedric Price, naturally led to, um, to also par partially restage the exhibition that we found in Venice. Uh, and after inviting Hans Ulrich and Samantha, um, wish we were here, again on display in the bar, became a fact. Um, wish we were here will be on display uh, till the end of the month, and those who haven't seen it, please make your way up the stairs. Um, so after the confirmation of this exhibition, the event in turn responded to the presence of the exhibition. So we decided to increase the emphasis on Cedric Price, and, and we are now absolutely delighted to also have Samantha on the, on the, on the panel. Um, very brief kind of index of the event. Um, the event is mainly structured in three chapters, if you like, which will all go under a kind of umbrella question, which is how does one make an archive productive? We'll start off with Marcus, uh, who will on, a, on the basis of a number of projects will give an introduction, after which um, Armin will give a short presentation, also on the basis of a number of projects. And then we'll go into uh, diving into the material of, uh, of Cedric Price, on which we'll have a, the protagonist on the table will react to the footage that we're going to show on the projection screens. Um, I think that's all for me. And I would like to ask you to join me in welcoming our four guests here to the AA. Uh, thank you very much, Jan, uh, for the... Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you very much for the uh, very interesting and nice introduction. Uh, and generally, thanks for inviting me to be back here. It's very nice to uh, be back after two and a half years uh, where I haven't been to the AA and to see all these changes happening here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a kind of brief introduction as to the context in which the project that we're going to talk about uh, has taken place, and then uh, I think we'll take it from there as a kind of more freestyle event. Um, the project that we're working on at the moment at the Hive in Karlsruhe is called the Archive as a Productive Space of Conflict, which is really trying to understand the kind of relationship. Unfortunately, uh, it's only on this side, so if you want to see it, you have to look. <laughs> you have to turn around. <laughs> So what we're really trying to do is to understand uh, the relationship between storage and production and to try to move away from the kind of traditional reading of the archive as a space of uh, storage towards a understanding of the archive as a space of production. And really also to try to look at what to do with an archive once it exists. Um, We've been undergoing a series of experiments trying to understand also how archival material in setup archives speaks to one another and how to then within that design productive relationships um, within that. And the starting point for this whole kind of inquiry was really uh, a visit some years ago to um, Hans Ulrich's archive in Berlin, of which this is uh, one of uh, the rooms, uh, which is an amazing kind of, kind of, I guess, 140 square meter apartment in, in a very kind of central area of Berlin. But um, it doesn't really function as an apartment because it doesn't have any infrastructure as, let's say, a, well, it has a kitchen, but, and it has one mattress. But other than that, it doesn't have any kind of, um, let's say, habitable infrastructure. But it's just full of banana crates and books. and. Um, for us, it was really interesting to see that even within that chaos, there's actually really kind of um, structured logic. And when Hans is there, he can find a book basically within two minutes, even if it's somewhere completely uh, in the back of a corner somewhere. Um, but at the same time, what was interesting was to see that um, 
although it's a space which us usually isn't used because it's a storage space, when Hunt is actually in Berlin, he really uses it as a kind of uh, resource. And um, beyond uh, Hunt using it just by himself to research material on a kind of wide range of topics and actors, there's also sometimes kind of meetings taking place there, like this one, um, but uh, kind of countless meetings, uh, which then also produce an interesting relationship with the material at play. Um, so at some point we started a conversation about what could actually happen with this material, and of course you can imagine if you look at all this, it's a kind of vast array of material, and um, for any archivist this would be a kind of nightmare because it would take at least two or three years to actually archive this. So uh, at some point Armin had this brilliant idea that um, there could actually be a way uh, at the uh, Hochschule für Gestaltung in Karlsruhe, where Armin was a professor at this point, um, that instead of actually trying to understand this as an archive as a whole, rather to zoom in into one super specific component, which he, good evening, uh, decided uh, to be the Cedric Price section of the film archive, of Hans' archive, uh, and that uh, this could really be a starting point for kind of ongoing um, kind of research. Um, do you want to say already something at this point, or should I just click through? Maybe it's because I, I know Hans, uh, the, all the work he is doing on with these um, interviews, and I thought maybe it would be interesting to uh, it would be interesting to the students, for the students to know better uh, Hans' work and uh, also in a certain way to give a service also to, to Hans to how to digitalize this material and to, to structure it. So it, it was made more a homage really to, to Hans' interview and uh, so Hans decided that a, a good uh, kind of uh, first step could be to work on, uh, on Cedric Price. But, um, so Actually, it's Cedric Price a little bit by chance also, or because of Hans decided that this is the chance, yes. Um, so what, th what this then led to was that um, Armin and his students basically uh, digitalized the, all the videotapes that were still, uh, I don't know what kind of format, I guess high... Uh, mini DV. Mini DV. Yeah. Uh, they really digitalized it and then started to work with this um, and trying to kind of set up again a kind of system in a way that speaks to each other of kind of short clips where the material was kind of uh, edited <coughs> in smaller chunks so that it would be kind of more uh, understandable. Um, and then as a next step uh, to try to actually make this material also to produce something, we went uh, um, through Hans's invitation to Torino, to Artissima, to um, set up a kind of experiment, let's say, where um, w one of the students, Kilian Fabis, was kind of almost like a VJ throwing clips on the wall, of which we actually didn't know what those clips would be. And it kind of generated a kind of roundtable situation or roundtable conversation in, in which Cedric uh, was actually part of. And the clips were edited in such a way that you couldn't actually in the clips here, Hans asking the questions, so you would only ever hear answers. So it was a kind of like a fictional, in a way, conversation, which then again was recorded and uh, developed a new kind of archive. Um, I'm just quickly gonna flip through a couple of images that uh, the students in Karlsruhe are working on at the moment, or a couple of experiments that they've uh, been undergoing in the last year. They did a live uh, kind of 12-hour uh, archiving of uh, the architecture marathon at Olafur Eliasson's studio last year, where basically th um, 12 students sat through the uh, entire marathon and in real time recorded uh, several kin kinds of data, partially uh, kind of self-initiated forms of, let's say, inquiry towards the material that was at play. So things like keywords, go live Google searches, something that what Ryan Gander would call loose associations, protocols, connections, and there was also, instead of doing photographs or uh, filming the actual event, there was uh, one student that do, did these kind of courtroom drawings to kind of capture some of the moments during these events. 
Um, so the idea of this kind of very ad hoc produced uh, publication, which was produced 24 hours after the event, was to really um, set up new relationships between the material that um, came into play at this event, and also to offer very different readings that weren't actually, uh, let's say, suggested by uh, people from the same milieu, but there would also be students, for example, from biology or medical science that we asked to, to come up with these keywords and mm -hmm. to produce kind of secondary reading of this event. And again, then in this publication, it produced these kind of relationships between the material. Uh, we also did a couple of um, excursions during the last year to places that we thought were really relevant in the context of uh, the archive as a productive space. We looked at uh, Christoph, Keller, uh, Christoph Keller's uh, Stellemühle, which I believe he was just here last week, um, which is also a very interesting context because the, it, uh, uh, let's say there's a kind of overlap of very different uh, programs and forms of production where he's still kind of following up on his kind of book production, but then of course he's, as you know, now also doing schnapps and other forms of uh, kind of well, you could, could almost argue he's also into the production of landscape to a certain extent. Um, and we also went to see a very interesting archive at a very remote, beautiful Alpine kind of hostel called Alpenhof, which used to host the um, Andreas Zist archive, which is this one when it was installed at the Zitterwerk in St. Gallen, and um, which leads me actually to the Zitterwerk itself, which will also produce a link to one of Armin's work uh, called Phenotypes. Um, this space is particularly interesting because um, it, it was in a way the starting point for this idea of the productive archive because it's, it's essentially a kind of um, uh, what used to be a kind of uh, industrial site which was then turned into an archive but with uh, very distinct components where different forms of archive of or archival practice come together. So this one looks like a fairly straightforward uh, kind of library, but it's actually an archive without order. And what you can see on the right uh, is this machine, which is basically two robots that along the entire facade, so to speak, of the um, books, uh, does a kind of three times a day, does a kind of real time uh, scanning of all the books. They all have RFID chips and uh, produces a kind of new order all the time according to the use uh, of the people that visit it and the researchers that come there. But, but the interesting thing is that this is not only um, produces new orders, but this is also being uh, tracked online, and it produces a kind of constant history and constantly new relationships of books. So you can imagine if you would go there as a user and you would just take out some books that you thought were interesting or where there was actually a relationship between them and you would put them back as a whole pile back into the shelf, the robot would recognize that and it would actually not only log this, but it would also offer this to a series of users online as kind of a set of new relationships between those books. At the same time, it also interestingly brings together the idea of uh, kind of printed archives, but also material archives. So what you can see there is a table where they also have things like what they call the material archive, which includes different types of timber, different types of wood, which is actually to a certain extent very architectural. And then this combined in this entire kind of um, series of uh, buildings on that side, also to do with kind of heavy and what I would call dirty production. So not only this kind of um, very clean scenario of the archive or library, but also very industrial production where a lot of uh, artists and sculptures are actually uh, getting work produced. Like this, for example, was a Paul McCarthy, a massive sculpture that they were producing at this time. So, and they're also uh, setting up these relationships between this kind of material archive and these other types of archive. This is again one of the Paul McCarthy pieces. And they're also then again archive uh, these kind of um, more sculptural pieces. Um, and have several kind of possibilities to really produce there. So they have also residency programs and so on. You should really check it out online. Um, another and the last uh, example I'm going to talk about, which we visited, was the Fabrika Harald Seemanns archive in Magia, um, which 
unfortunately at the moment it's a little bit difficult to visit because um, it looks like they're going to sell it to Documenta so they've kind of put a ban on visits but we managed to get in with um, Harald's last um, kind of PA and this of course again is a very interesting example because it's really an archive not as a storage facility but an archive really as a space to work so really a place of production and you could also see that in kind of very interesting little details like um, for example these kind of lists with kind of these uh, speed dial lists for your phone and all the fax numbers where they were constantly kind of uh, pro there was constantly kind of production happening in that space um, this is the last thing I'm going to talk about now is a um, project that again the students in Karlsruhe are working on as a kind of test scenario for how these uh, archives can actually spatialize. There's a German, uh, small German publisher called <coughs> Merve, which um, actually sold its uh, archive a couple of years ago to the ZKM in Karlsruhe. Um, and this archive has just been sitting in the basement for three years. And nobody's ever really uh, dealt with it. And we're now working with the ZKM on a kind of um, spatialization of this where there will be a kind of space that will be given to this uh, for three years where this is Tom Lamberti the, the publisher um, where we will try to really create a workspace where this material becomes activated and again uh, can be used for further production um, and to sum up there's also a publication that we're working on at the moment where this whole archival research of the last one and a half years will um, come to some form of uh, conclusion. And we're dealing with this both with the students at the curatorial practice department, but also at the graphic design department. As you can see here, Zach uh, was also one of the people that gave some input on this. Um, I would now like to hand over to Armin and maybe continue with phenotypes? Yeah, I can just sh uh, show a project that also was developed with the students of uh, Karlsruhe together with uh, the curatorial design department uh, uh, by Wilfried uh, Kuhn and um, so uh, uh, the, the idea was how to present my photographic archive and um, the project started basically most uh, 10 years ago with an invitation of Hans Ulrich Obrist at Utopia Station. And uh, uh, decided to, to present my archive in the internet and allow the public to, uh, in a certain way, to be curator of the, of the archive and select images out of archive to compose a, a book. And of course, 10 years ago, uh, the, uh, did you, so the idea to, that there would be a si uh, edition of books and uh, each book would be singular but uh, and be printed with uh, digital offset and of course it, uh, digital offset was a complete new technology and uh, in the meantime it's complete uh, in a certain obsolete so it's there's always the risk to to work with this kind of technology and uh, so um, coming to the project the idea was how to bring uh, this uh, project that was on the internet back to the physical space, to have both quality of, of uh, interaction and uh, physical experience. So we, we developed uh, uh, with the students uh, uh, a model uh, where a kind of shelf where the each photograph, there were a thousand photographs, uh, could be displayed. So the, the, the photographs were printed really on, on real photographic paper and the on with a cardboard and on the back was a RFID and in a certain these are some models of of the printer I collaborated uh, with the Sony uh, GSL lab in uh, Paris with Peter Hanappe uh, and so the idea was that in a certain way the the, s the, the space would transform itself in a software that so that, that when the people enter the space they would understand by themselves what uh, what what could be the option, the options? Here we are in the ZKM. So basically, you you had this wall uh, with the the whole archive, and the the show was 
transforming itself continuously, changed by the public. And what was interesting that insurance of the museum refused to insure the photographs because they were touched by the public. So the idea that the, the museum doesn't accept uh, the, the, the photograph as artwork because they, there is the interaction with the, with the public. So you, you could select your uh, kind of your narration on the wall, uh, but also then bring eight pictures to the table that would recognize uh, the selection, would show them uh, on, a, mm, uh, on, on the on the touch screen. Uh, also, we collaborated with a with a London graphic designer, Alex Rich, that made the the graphic interface. And then there was this little printer that uh, first we thought to to ask Heidelberg uh, Printing uh, that is near Karlsruhe to have a big printer. But then we we thought to reduce alm almost in a Japanese way to and to use the the printer that printed the ticket of the ZKM Museum to print this kind of Leporello, so a, a kind of almost haiku book that the public could bring and uh, bring home. Uh, and this is the version then at the um, um, Sao Paulo Biennale in the building of Oscar Niemeyer with another kind of, of uh, display. And uh, there was also the idea that uh, you could see the t uh, titles of books that would have uh, selections uh, uh, of photograph similar to yours. And so there was a moment where there were the you could do the book in the internet, you could do the book in Karlsruhe, and you could do the book in uh, Sao Paulo. So basically, the same show was in three different places. In interact, interact, in in interact, yeah, they had interaction at the same time. Maybe, maybe later I can um, show you some photographs, but of their from the archive while we speak, maybe. And uh, a, a similar, uh, similar uh, action was uh, was then because. Uh, Maybe the same group of students then worked on the on the Cedric uh, Price uh, interviews of Hans. M maybe a similar approach then uh, developed, and the 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 hope is then that maybe we could uh, work on on more of Hans' archive and see what happens when when you have uh, uh, material from different kind of fields, not only architects but also artists or science, and then what happens when there is seems overlapping from different structures or worlds. And uh, S Samantha choose, f choose the four uh, clips. Maybe I don't know when Samantha, maybe I give the words to Samantha. I also, I can be take the place of Kilian and be your video DJ, and <laughs> <laughs> you can choose. And <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, um, yes, I think we should look at the footage because it's. Well, you, and you can see it upstairs also, but I think I'd just I'd like to say one thing um, in terms of why um, it's quite nice to be in the same room all together because it, we've made an exhibition now twice and we've never really well I've met you <laughs> but, <laughs> but we don't really know each other and that's quite um, <laughs> it's a very nice way of working um, because you you realise that you're all you're all uh, well there. Are, there are common interests. Cedric was the link for you, but it was the, 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 the clearly the, the way of dealing with this archive was, was more the motivation. Um, my motivation is, is to, to look at an archive, um, but in an entirely different way. Uh, I suppose just because I just want to look at the material. And, the, and so for me to see this kind of very digitized end, um, I feel I'm at the very uh, other end, which is sort of pulling out drawers and folders and bits of paper um, to look at the, the look at the drawings, I suppose, and the models, and that, and that very uh, sort of uh, which is a very it takes up very physical space. And I, I mean, I I do that particular activity in in Canada at the moment in Montreal. We were talking about the um, CCA, which is this. Uh, enormous building which seems to sort of be sort of neoclassical um, 
postmodern monolith, which uh, it is, appears to literally be sinking into the ground. And I, and I dare say it probably is actually, because about three or four stories beneath the ground are where the archives are held. And they're just the sort of physical weight of, um, you're very conscious of the weight of the material. And as soon as you uh, start to want to find something, uh, you're faced with lists endless, mm. endless lists of numbers and uh, numbers that don't relate to anything tangible or physical or uh, related to a description of something that you know or have a memory of or maybe have never seen before so you're never going to find it because you've never seen it and now it's just a number. Um, so there's that very strange disconnected uh, process that you go through and then you go in and you open folders and you have a list and you think you're extremely organized because you've made a detailed list and now you and you know it's the project that you're looking for uh, and then you're trying to make your record of it in order to take it back and edit it and process it but then what you what, what you record it on is this ridiculous machine that then gives you another list of numbers and you have a file on your laptop which is numbers and not names so there's a kind of level of intelligence in that whole process which is completely missing which is why it's so nice to meet you <laughs> because I think you've got the technology now um, and, th and that's the bit that really seems to because it is a, a, a massively cumbersome thing to deal with as has been demonstrated by what we've sort of seen bits of and and then it, and we haven't even talked about the content which seems to be the bit that is really what we're, everyone's trying to get at. So I think there's a, um, the negotiation of all of those things is, is, I think technology is definitely the answer, Cedric. You, def you asked the question a long time ago, but it is the answer for what you do afterwards. And I think it's a, it, um, in, in relation to Cedric particularly, he was always uh, thinking in, I mean, he, he had a sort of uh, list of, of drawings or, or types of drawings, for instance, and there were, um, you started with the drawings in your head and then there were, I've got a, a list of them he called them in-head drawings which are kind of your sketches which are the things that are on the wall upstairs uh, then your in-house drawings they get then selected and then developed in-house in, in the office and then there's the in-action drawings which are the ones where you go to the you know it, it, in, you engage with the, some external activity like construction you know you need to make construction drawings and they um, they have to communicate to somebody else. Um, and then he has in for, and I don't really uh, typically say, in forward-minded retrospect drawings, <laughs> which I, he describes as post-mortem drawings, which are reflections and then improvements, which he did do when he published projects. He would then, pu he would only publish them if he got the opportunity then to, to make a note and say, well, actually, that was a really bad idea and actually we could have done it differently. So there was a kind of ongoing uh, awareness of the project uh, being ongoing and now I suppose I wonder what the next one would be if it's not going to be a drawing but it'll be some other way of viewing the work and, and looking at seeing the work so I suppose that's what needs to be described um, I mean maybe to add one thing about the kind of technological aspect one of the things that I mean actually hasn't mentioned which I think was really interesting was that you at some point also had this idea to talk to the ZKM to use this special software that they've developed there, right? Where one could actually produce this material, but then really open it uh, to the public, as it were, so people, if they had the password to log in and so on, they could actually really also start edit the material themselves, if I understand correctly. Uh, well, the, the idea is that Hans has so much uh, video interviews that it would be nice to, that this could be a module and then maybe there could be a collaboration also, for example, with other universities, that there are more, more than one set of people to organize the material. Yes, but I don't know if this is something that Hans wants. So, yeah. <laughs> I think he's uh, thinking about it, uh, but <laughs> it's just a proposal. But I think the, the, the idea is how do you activate? And, uh, of course, is to create also win-win situations, that Hans has somebody that works on his work. Yeah. Students can... Uh, uh, can work on the material that maybe is also, it's, it's like having Hans making continuously lectures through the <laughs> videotapes. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I think one thing which, is, which was fascinating was really this idea when, uh, you know, uh, Marcus and 
Armin came up with this idea of the tagging. I think it was Armin who found the technology. No? And I mean, in some kind of way, there has always been this question, what could happen no, with the archive? And for me, um, I've never really, I mean, there hasn't never really been a reason why I filmed them. I think the only reason why I filmed them is that as a teenager, I met Jonas Mekas, and we were always sitting in cafes, and he always had his camera. And so, you know, in some kind of way, it just became kind of organic to sort of just film them. That there wasn't really a master plan, you know, that I would film my interviews. I did the interviews as a kind of, a, and I still do them as a research tool for my exhibitions. Um, and I suppose also, I mean, they're never really done to be, you know, for, for someone. I mean, people very often ask, you know, who commissioned you to do these things? And usually, you know, there is no nobody who commissions them. They're kind of done out of a self impetus or something like that, out of a necessity or an urgency. Um, and so, so far, only really the texts have been used. Uh, I mean, until this project started, no, only the texts have been used. I mean, transcriptions and books, there have been many books uh, published. Um, and in some kind of way, uh, there was always a sort of a, a question, what could one do with the, you know, the moving images? Because there are these 2,000 hours, no? And uh, I mean, the interesting thing is, and I think that was the sort of fascinating, you know, beginning of this Cedric archive is, that it could really be tagged, as you can see upstairs, according to different topics. So we can go fan palace, and then we can have everything Cedric ever told me about the fan palace, which is a very, very frequent topic. We can go pop up parliament, and we've got everything you know he ever mentioned about pop up parliament. And uh, in some kind of way, uh, it's a beginning. But we could imagine that obviously, if we think the whole interview project as a kind of a polyphonic, you know, archive, we could start to think that actually the different protagonists in the archive could at a certain point start to talk to each other. And then it could become really interesting. You know, once it's, and that's something we once discussed with Ami when you know, it's all tagged, it could sort of start to become, you know, we could have then in answer to Cedric, because obviously I've got hundreds and hundreds of interviews where other architects tell me how they, and artists mainly, how they were inspired by the Fan Palace. So we could have all these voices, you know, who were, in, uh, what, what did actually Cedric's Fan Palace idea trigger? And so I think there's a huge, um, potential in, in, uh, in that, so to answer, I mean, I'm actually, I'm definitely convinced that, <laughs> I'm definitely convinced that it, is, that it is the future. But I mean, one thing which was also interesting, I mean, it wasn't, I don't think it was actually chance that we started with, um, with Cedric. I think it was a very, uh, um, a, a sort of, a, yeah, a, a decision, and it was also obvious why we would start with the archive of Cedric, because, you know, within the archive, I mean, an archive always hides another archive, and I think there are lots of different archives within the archives but there has hardly been uh, um, such intense interviews as with Cedric, because we almost met, met sort of every second, third week. Or I mean, I lived in Paris at the time, and I would come to London regularly, and we would always do these early morning sessions. Um, and it's also, I mean, it was based on a, on a dialogue which had built up very slowly over many years. And at the beginning, Cedric never wanted to give interviews. He said we could meet, but not if I wanted to do an interview. And then after about three, four years, he started to be fine with the interviews. But always after 30, 40, 50 minutes, he said, it's enough. And so uh, there are actually really chapters. No, it's each time a chapter. It's each time about uh, something else. Um, and it's, it's a lot, a lot of, um, of material. And so it felt somehow interesting to, to begin with uh, this idea of one person, um, of one great protagonist, one visionary, you know, whom I've interviewed uh, again and again and again. Uh, and that's obviously what David Sylvester always said. I mean, for me, the, to, to interview Cedric again and again is a bit what David Sylvester tried to do with Francis Bacon. No, I mean, if you interview the same person again and again and again, it becomes kind of like more more and more um, interesting. Now, obviously, there would be all kinds of other possibilities where one could sort of uh, classify the archive, all of that. I mean, one could sort of, yeah, one could follow other architects I've interviewed many times. I mean, there are also about 20 hours with Jonah Friedman, so that could be, because I'm mean, said today, what could we do next? So one could obviously, you know, uh, have all the interviews with Jonah, Jonah Friedman or several other architects or artists I spoke to again and again. Um, what one could also do is obviously what Rosemary Trockel always says. She always says one should do something with all the great pioneers because I've got about 25 interviews with people whose eyes saw a century, you know, like uh, put architects or artists in their late 90s or early 100s. It goes from Gadamer, the philosopher, to Niemeyer, who is now 103. So, you know, one could have these centenary uh, archives. So that could be another, you know, archive. One could obviously also classify it according to, 
um, to cities, but then there's also all kinds of typologies. For example, one of the things I think, and maybe we can look at that later, which I think is very fascinating in terms of, of Cedric's conversation, is that very often the conversations were actually based on his notebooks. They were based on these extraordinary sketchbooks and notebooks, uh, which are so central in his practice, and we would just look at those notebooks, and I would hold the camera on the pages, and he would, you know, go from page to page and tell me what's on the page and, and say which project it is and some inspirations, very loose associations to come back to, uh, to Ryan Gano. Um, and so obviously that's another kind of thing. I mean, that's a, a typology that pops up very, very often in the interest that yeah, one would look at the book or one would look at the, at the notebook. But uh, yeah, maybe we could start with that. I don't know. Which is the notebook? I don't know. I don't. I can't. I can't really remember <laughs> Actually, what we chose. They may not well, have it. Well, let's see. Uh, we can also... Yeah, I mean, just time? maybe in the meantime, to those of you, uh, to those of the audience who maybe don't are not so familiar with your Cedric Price archive, maybe you could say something about the kind of recurring, are there certain recurring themes in a way? Because you said the more you talk to him, the more interesting it became. Yes, I mean, the thing is, you know, one of the things I think which uh, it was key was Cedric uh, was very uncomfortable with his idea of working within uh, sort of architecture exhibitions. And I think one of the things which was very wonderful about this dialogue was that I never invited him to the architecture world. I always invited him into the art world. And so, uh, and he liked that a lot. So that we did a show at the Musée d'Art Moderne in Paris. We did a show at the Villa Medici in Rome. So all art museums or, or, or art, you know, art galleries, we did a show at INIVA in London. Uh, uh, all kinds of things. So, so the interviews are always about doing something together. Like all my, my conversations are production of reality conversations. They're not conversations for conversation's sake. So I mean, it's, it's really got a lot to do. Then we would do a newspaper for Agnes B. You know? So it's all about producing this newspaper and uh, choosing the drawings for this newspaper. And then it was about a book. I mean, it's this book recipe on which we worked for several years, which was really uh, the, a book of, of its R.E. Uh, as RECP, -R -E recipe, it's a, an idea really of a book which would have a, a limited lifespan, like Cedric's building should have a limited lifespan. So the idea was that the book um, would actually have an expiry date and uh, could only be sold until a certain you know, point in time and then would have to you know, uh, be taken out of the bookshops. Um, and, uh, and somehow this book included a lot of drawings, included all the interviews. It was the first time we edited, you know, made an edit of of the different interviews, and that uh, a lot of the interviews have to do with that, really. And then it also includes very strange projects. I mean, for example, at some point, Cedric did an exhibition in my Nano Museum, which is like a museum uh, I found it in the 90s, which is two on three inches. So it's a sort of a portable museum. It's this idea that you can take the museum wherever you go. It's a sort of Duchampian idea of uh, the, uh, the, the portable museum. Uh, and it was really this idea that Cedric did actually his museum exhibition whilst we spoke, and so on. Yeah. I think that's this one yeah. in Paris. It's the Should Paris Hotel. It? So yeah. we'll and it was also it was a conversation with Cedric and with Ellen of Ron. Uh, I'm just trying to work out the length of Harley Street, 323 yards. Anyhow, it's, it's, it's that sort of distance. It's absolutely yeah. straight, Harley Street. Yeah. So we can see now. This is so it's the, basically perspectivism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're actually building the universe in Harley Street with a coin, a nine-foot thing. Mm -hmm. We've got the coin, nano, nine feet. Um, now, the uh, distance is measured in cups of coffee as mm -hmm. well, but... So it's 3,876 cups of coffee. Yes, um, which is 320 three yards because um, trying to, I think we can do it 320 yards it's about a fifth of a mile now a fifth of a mile takes four or five minutes walking so you can walk down Harvey Street yeah. the distance of, of uh, the earth to the moon and at the same time, you can experience it whilst having a coffee. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So we, we made the actual cups of coffee a measurement mm -hmm. as well. So it's a measurement in time and distance of the universe. Yeah. Distance between Earth and Sun, the diameter 
and the sun is is nine foot diameter compared to that coin. And then then we can show those are the relative diameters of of the planets, including the Earth, which is there, which is still yellow, very faintly. And that is that is the Sun mm. diameter. So we've we've got the universe on this sheet, allied to the map and the map of Harley Street. So that's Samantha's coffee cup, right? Yeah, it, was, it was my cup. <laughs> but that, yeah, well, it, that was a, a, yes, that's, that's the sum total of my archive, I think, that cup. It's a small, <laughs> 10 ounces, which is quite portable. Um, it was a small project that we uh, had during the coffee, <coughs> coffee years um, where we decided we had pa plain white paper cups and that that was potentially surface to print on. And, um, and, and make drawings on them. And so we asked Cedric if he'd be interested in making a drawing for a coffee cup, which of course he thought was fantastic when we told him that it would be uh, printed in an edition of uh, 10,000 at a time. And then those cups would be disposable and then you'd find them in places far away as Victoria Station. And so the idea of distributing drawings at great distances and so many, um, for him as a, as a project was a, of great interest, so we were very delighted that he did that. And then little did I know it would turn into a, an, an item in a very small museum, or a very large museum. Um, but it seems to me, I, I mean, we, should, we probably should look at some clips, but I think there's, um, I suppose I have a question for, uh, this question, uh, the, the word archive, I think I, I find, um, I suppose quite difficult really. Because it, because you're sort of talking about something else. We're talking about <coughs> archive is the thing that I visualise under the ground in mm. in large vaults and in boxes. And you're talking about another this kind of next thing on the list of kinds of drawings or kinds of ways of looking or finding or retrieving material, um, and then making a new m making it come alive again or making use of it. And I d I just wonder whether. Um, Archive is a useful word anymore because we use it a lot. But uh, I, I don't know what the word is. It probably needs inventing. But it's uh, it, I, otherwise, I think it gets. Um, I, I, I get a terrible feeling, and I get it uh, making an exhibition like this. Actually, anyway, um, is at that moment where you, 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 you're in that position where you, you're dealing with somebody else's material, um, which is still well in Cedric cases is, is within all our living memory so it's it's still very much alive I think as you go further back it because there's, there's a, a, diff, a distance on that but I think when you're talking about something which is very cur current I mean it's an instant archive in your case it's it's barely had time to sit on the shelf before it's coming out that um, that that is a different entity yeah and I don't know what can you think about that well I mean the moment it's it's again about production, then it also becomes projective again. And then it, you kind of take it from <laughs> this idea, you take it away from this idea of something that you store or what you described as something that's happening in the basement, so to speak, into something that really becomes again a kind of active agent in a way. Okay, I, can, I can speak about my, my, let's say, normal practice as photographer. Because as a photographer, you basically obsessed about ar archive because you simply produce something and you, you have to store it. and but also, it's, so it's, it gets very bureaucratical, but also it's a kind of test uh, because in a certain way you say, if, if I produce something, I know that I have all to do this boring work after work, so do I really want to make this photograph? Because every time I make a photograph, <laughs> I know it's a pleasure to make the photograph, but there is a very boring work afterwards, <laughs> after work, after, afterward. So you really think, okay, I, n when I make a click, then I have all this uh, homework to do. So it, it's a kind of filter that it's a kind of, uh, for me, it's a kind of ecology too, because I have to be sure that the work is, is really interesting that, uh, because I have to do this boring work afterwards, but also I have to think, will this work be really interesting in 10 or 20 years? Or will it be interesting also out of the production context, context for which I, I produce? Because sometimes it's a, it's a work that 
that you produce for yourself because you as artist are, are, uh, are your own producer or sometimes it's a commission and how can I get then this work out of this commission to be to that it has value also in other time or other distribution channel context so yeah this is just to maybe you can also mention your own website because that's also a very interesting model I think where basically you're you, you're putting your own archive online in a way and then people can again make suggestions as to what kind of book they want to produce from this and then yes ma maybe it's, it's also kind of uh, a reaction of of the way to 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 produce uh, photograph uh, in in the art world where you produce uh, image that then is kind of uh, printed and and fixed as, as a unique object uh, in the gallery and uh, and s so the idea was was uh, to open up this, uh, the, the, this this body of work and and see what happens in a certain way it's it's again a kind of test to see if, if the work is uh, interesting enough to to see what happens when when it it's open to other interaction and also generally is, is also to think not at, at, uh, at the narrative of a single uh, image uh, to block it to this narrative but see what happens when when there is a combination like what happens when when a grammatic uh, develops or when when a set of pictures is, is put together it's, it's a little bit like uh, like a cinem cinematic use of uh, photographs is it possible for you to track uh, these relationships that pe that users have made when they've printed their own books? Well, so uh, the um, Peter Hanappe that uh, uh, works at Sony CSL Lab, they, they did uh, a research on, because th basically there were more than 15,000 books produced through all the, the shows. And for them, 50,000 was not enough. It's uh, because when they were interested to, to work on, on the theme of tagging. So how are words related to the different set of combinations? And uh, so for them, it, it was statistically a, a small set. But what was interesting, the certain photographs were always positioned, maybe the, only, the, the most interesting thing, that certain photographs were always positioned in the beginning of a sequence, certain in the middle, certain in the end, almost as, as some photographs would have some choreographical value or some that some are always used to open a narrative, some are used always to define a center, like there would be always three acts and each photograph could be related to an act. Maybe this is the most, and of course then there is always always the, the, this risk of, of that you have also banal information, like you, you have in on Amazon that if you put this picture then you use also this picture and this kind of that also, also then is a risk that to, to get in, into always this, um, yeah, this, this poetic of economics. Uh, this is the most sold one. This is the most attractive one. This is the, the loser. This is the, yeah, which is also a risk of this kind of archive poetics. Should we look at another clip? Yes. The coat uh, and symbols. <coughs> Maybe we can just uh, recapitulate yes. what you said about uh, about about mean time and this time-based exhibition. Right. Um, it's a small exhibition, and and therefore there is a, a shortage of space. So yeah. the images, um, so, some images, the models, all sorts of things, but there is no explanation until it, it's in in the cold weather <coughs> in Canada. Therefore, people take their coats off when they arrive. And when they leave and get their coats back, only then are they given a catalogue. They can't buy the catalogue at the exhibition. So they're, they're, they are um, the, the shortage of their own time is reminded to them. They, they, they have a memory yeah. that the time is, was rather short because only after it was over did they get the catalogue because there was no room or time. It's a small exhibition. 
So there was an emphasis of, of um, time in, in a different context, rather like some of the exhibits are um, anticipatory designs that never were achieved. So other things anticipate designs that never could be achieved. Which are unrealizable. Yes. So there's disappointment and the unrealizable. And, and that should be related to the, uh, to the experience of everyone who comes. Yeah. So that they realize what, what that was about. Um, so that, that is what we're aiming at. It's also interesting because you, you mentioned before that people might have to come again, so it's, it's the uh, idea that's that right. there is not one path to the exhibition, but that yes, there are these yes, several paths. Yes, and they, they will probably only decide definitely to come again when they remember what they've seen, but then they have a reminder, but only in written form, of what they can't see anymore unless they go back to the exhibition. Yeah. So it's it's um, it, it's it's rather like, as we describe the maze, the snail, and the person with too much time on their hands and wanting to be having a toy to play with. Um, it's kind of interesting that this is actually about an exhibition, no? And uh, uh, maybe. It was actually the thing which came to my mind when Samantha you asked the question about about you know about the archive because I mean obviously and even I mean I think within your practice there are different forms of archives and obviously there are the works where you thematize archives or you produce archives participatory archives all kinds of archives but when we met at the beginning of the 90s one of the things you did and I think always did which is a, one of the very important of your archives is to actually photograph exhibitions photograph performances photograph uh, things which otherwise very often are maybe not documented. I mean, there's a lot of performances which only exist through your photographs, otherwise they are not, uh, they are not documented. Um, and I think this whole idea of um, exhibition and, and, and archive is a very interesting topic, because very often, I mean, you know, as a curator, I obviously often, you know, I'm interested in finding documents on older exhibitions, and very often there is nothing. And so, you know, here we have Cedric actually telling us about a very major exhibition which he did, which he, one could say, was very curatorial involved of his own work uh, in Canada, which was all about time and which has inspired generations of artists. I mean, Philippe Pareno has been hugely inspired by such, by such ideas. Um, if we want to find out today about this exhibition, you know, meantime, I think, you know, it's quite difficult in terms of memory and exhibition. Very often, I mean, the other day I made a research on Lyotard's Les Immateriaux, maybe one of the most important exhibitions of the last 50 years, when the philosopher Lyotard devoted an entire year of his life to do a show, you know, we hardly could find a single photograph of this exhibition. So this idea of, of um, exhibition and memory, I think, is a, is a very important thing. Uh, and how can, and it's also important in relation to architecture because we are here in an architecture context. I mean, so many important things are done by architects with the medium of the exhibition, but it's probably the most underrated and most underdocumented thing. I mean, very often it doesn't even enter the catalogs of architects, what they do with exhibitions, you know, and it, it's, it's somehow very um, under, under, yeah, under, undervalued or underdocumented. And one of the things, I mean, that's a question to you, I mean, that's one of your archives is that. I mean, you've got thousands of photographs of exhibitions, the whole thing you did with Anessa Beecroft, performances, that sort of form of documentation of other people's work. Uh, yes, this is also how I met, you know, <laughs> photographing your uh, show in the Carton uh, place, which was, yeah, some, some time ago. And uh, yes, it, it's also, it's again, it's about the practice of photography. Is, uh, photography is a great excuse to know people and know places. Yes, it's not about photography, but about the experience you can do through photography. Yeah. Uh, hello. Hi. Um, I was wondering how uh, your archive fever, your collective archive fever, uh, Hans, is your 
your protest against forgetting, which is one of the impulses behind the interviews project, behind uh, the archive. How does that correspond or converse with what's the, what to me uh, is one of the great maneuvers or legacies of uh, Cedric Price's work, which was a really radical kind of iconoclasm, iconoclastic impulse with respect to infinitude, right? So um, one of his, you know, it seems to be one of the radical things that he would constantly reiterate is the the sort of the the will to eternity that most architecture or most architects somehow unconsciously or consciously aspire to was something to be vigilantly worked against, right? So buildings that have shelf lives that aren't there forever. There isn't this kind of, as I say, there isn't a, a yearning towards a horizon of infinitude. Yet the archive, the archive impulse, the archive fever is somehow. Um, how do these things correlate and what would a Cedric, and maybe Eleanor could <laughs> shed some light on this. I wonder what would, uh, uh, an, could you imagine what uh, an, an archive impulse a la Cedric Price would have been? Would it have been a library or an archive that also has uh, a, a fin affinitude? that doesn't exist forever, that is only accessed once every hundred years, et cetera, et cetera. I'm wondering how much of that kind of criticality, that iconoclastic criticality that for me was the real hallmark of everything that he's said that we've just seen in these few minutes, applies to or can be taken up in what you're doing or, or are you a kind of rehearsing, it seems to me, an archive fever that doesn't have that iconoclastic spirit. Maybe it shouldn't, but I'm, I, I'm sort of Keen. I mean, I know there was the book that was produced on, on um, Cedric Price's library, this kind of uh, database, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm, I'm, uh, I'm keen to imagine, you know, a, libr a library in, a, in the same way, uh, a university that doesn't s stand still, uh, a school that isn't there forever, an archive that isn't accessible always. Um, it seems to me one of the, uh, we were just discussing this, Zach and I now, that um, when information is, is you know kind of ubiquitously permeable to all of us um, to resist that to make something actually difficult to get to difficult to consume actually reinforces the importance or the or the the the, the kind of value of that content and and it seems to me maybe that some something or <laughs> there's a there's a sentiment that could could be you know allied to 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 the Cedric Price archive I wonder. <laughs> 